much. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to give you a bit of background on like what this entire project is. Um, I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit about like why we cannot just use regular expressions or, or crap for doing this kind of stuff. Then comes the actual meat of the talk where I'm going to be showing you how to use SEMgraph on your own projects to find like security vulnerabilities that you've recognized. Um, yep, yeah. and then a couple more interesting sections. I'll need to list them all, I guess. So let's start with the background. So yeah, uh, I will spend very few, very little time on this slide. Nobody cares really, but hi, I'm Benta, and I work at this company called R2C. It's a San Francisco based startup. Um, our mission is to improve code security and reliability across the globe profoundly. That's an important word right there, but I'm not going to get into that. And yeah, so that's um, obviously, I've, I've never even seen any of these people in person, even though I've worked here for more than a year on this project. Uh, sadly, everything right now is done over video calls. And so like this SEMgraph thing, so I, like, I mentioned already, it's an open source project. This is a screenshot I took today of the GitHub repo. Um, fairly active. <laughs> we have a release almost every week. Um, feel free to check it out if, if you want to. And just to give you like a quick bit of history about like this whole project. Uh, it's over 10 years old, kind of. Uh, 10 years old, kind of. Uh, the first version was written at like uh, at Facebook with a security engineer who worked at Facebook at the time. Now he works for us, actually. Um, and yeah, it's actually um, the, the same person, Johan, the original author. He also contributed, uh, was one of like the core maintainers of Cochinel, which is a tool that's used for refactoring and security scanning of the Linux kernel for quite a while. So yeah, basically, he like if anyone can take credit for SEMgraph, it's him. Now, um, I already told you that we use SEMgraph for security scanning, and you can use it for security scanning too. Obviously, the first question that comes up at these times is like whether it supports your language. So here's this handy little table of our language support status. Uh, you can see on the left all the like stable supported languages that we can scan, and we have a whole bunch of other languages that we are adding right now that's in development or alpha testing right now. Uh, I'm just going to leave this up for a couple seconds so you can definitely find all your languages. And also I, I wanted to mention like, um, you know, sometimes people care about the open source license. So SAMGRAP is LGPL licensed. Okay, enough background. I want to talk about some static analysis theory, let's say. It's not going to be like really hard, <laughs> hardcore theory. But basically, you might ask that if I have this issue where like I cannot have a decorator on a function with request args inside it, the, the example from the very beginning of this talk, like why don't I use regex to just figure out um, when that's happening? Um, now, the issue is uh, captured very well in this XKCD. Basically, if you use regex, now you have 100 problems, or in our case, 100 false positives uh, when trying to detect these security issues. Specifically, um, the first four of these problems I'm going to list here. So let's say that you're just like trying to blacklist or block list, or deny list the exec function. It's like you don't want your developers to just use exec, or at least you want to be notified of when they are doing it, because they're probably up to something shady. Um, so on the left, you see some like different ways that the exec word could be mentioned. And so if you just write a nice little grep pattern where you try to notify or alert if exec is being used, sure, like the first one, that's easy to handle. The second one, easy to handle. Now, when you realize that like a different sort of white space situations might occur, you realize that you need to like think about this now, include this um, white space capture group, like optional white space capture group, maybe handle it over multiple lines, like in the fourth example, uh, where you like really start having issues is maybe they are not actually using the entire 
the, the, the actual exec function. Maybe they just imported an exec function from a different module, which is safe. Um, or maybe the function name just ends with exec, or maybe exec shows up in a comment, a code comment, or maybe it's in a string, which is like not a issue you want to be bothering your developers about. It's like literally not an issue. So these are like the first couple of problems with grab. And the reason that this problem exists with grep is because like grep searches through strings, like regular expressions are meant to search through strings. Now, code, however, is really on its deepest like philosophical level. It's not a string. The, the string, the text that you see for code is just a way of representing what it actually is that's easy for us to read. So, so this text is really just like some human friendly representation of what actually is executing because like what code really is uh, in almost all languages uh, is a tree, a syntax tree. Uh, you can see an example on the right. So like when you have a function definition, you're going to have a node in this tree, which is like, let's say on the left side, you have the function signature on the right side, you have the functions code when you have a function call, like down here on line four, you're going to have the function name and then you're going to have the arguments, which is like really not text. It's supposed to be a tree when you look at it fundamentally. Okay. And now obviously the issue here is that regular expressions are for searching text and not trees. Um, now, of course, for matching trees, there are solutions already as well. So like, there's like all these tools you're definitely going to be familiar with, like Bandit or ESLint or, or uh, PyLint, whatever else. There's like a billion open source tools for scanning various languages. But now go back to our case where we just found out that this decor discussion decorator that we have is not applicable in a certain case. So like now if I want to have a scanning rule for this, then I need to <clears throat> go into the tool I use, let's say PyLint, and I need to become an expert in the AST syntax of Python. I need to understand like how decorators are attached and like the low level code parsing part of Python. I need to become like an expert. And even in this like super simple thing where like you're trying to detect usages of eval, if you go look at the ESLint rule for this, they have this huge file for just detecting where eval is used. It's 307 lines of code. Um, like I definitely don't want to be doing that either. Okay. So now what's in the middle? Um, that's going to be SAMGraph, obviously, where like our philosophy is that when, like when you're trying to do scanning or analysis, you should be thinking about the scanning the same way you think about the code itself. So when you want to find when eval is being used, you just write eval dot, 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 which looks exactly the same as source code. And it's actually going to be parsed into a tree, just like the original source code. And then we just match those trees against each other. So instead of now like describing a text string that you want to match, you describe the tree part that you want to match. And it just looks exactly like your code. Okay. So now, now that we know about trees, all about trees, we can go ahead to learning how to use SunGraph. Unless there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer anything. I, this frankly could be confusing. So if you have a question, shoot me a question in chat or raise your hand or anything. Otherwise, I'm just going to move on to the tutorials. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's have a super simple example. This is pretty much what I've been describing as the eval deny listing case where you just don't want to allow people to use eval. Do I have internet is another great question. <laughs> Let's see. Also, if you are connected and you can see me here, have a random cat. I get a new one for every new tab page. Sometimes they are friends. <laughs> Oh, I see. So SunGrip is down. So I'm going to show you the super secret staging subdomain 
which I can still use, hopefully. All right. So our little example here is almost the same as the eval example still. However, in this case, we want to be finding calls to RC4 in Golang, because it's just like an insecure cryptographic function. Nobody should use it. So the only thing we do here is, let's say I want to find this first line only in line 12, where it goes like RC4 new cipher key. So I can literally just copy that code up here, where I'm writing my Sangraph rule or Sangraph search pattern, run it. And it already matched two of the usages, because like it noticed that on line 12, we have this function call with this argument, and line 15, we have the same function call with this argument as well. You know, like Even though we had lots of weird white space, it didn't trip it up. <clears throat> now to match the other usages of this function, very simply, I'm just going to be like dot, dot, dot. Uh, argument could be anything. We still don't want this function in our code. And <clears throat> there you go. Now we have three matches. And notice how, unlike if we actually just used graph, Sangrip understands that this is a string, this is a comment, these are not actual issues. All right. That's the most basic little thing that we could show you. So let's move a bit further. So the next thing would be finding users of an entire module. Uh, this is again a Golang example where you have, uh, and I'm just going to keep adding staging naked before e each of these URLs. I'm glad that I, I am not on call right now because I'm on this meetup. <laughs> and what I wanted to do here is detect in Golang whenever this unsafe module is used for any reason. OK. So what we're going to do is, again, we could start out very simple. I'm just going to do this little search. And let's ignore this message, which is not updated yet. So I'm going to say that any method that could be on this unsafe module, which again is like insecure, never should be used because it like exposes really low level um, memory management that you shouldn't be doing yourself. If we run this one, okay. So first of all, we got two results. But what's cool is because I added this like dollar sign and uh, all uppercase name, whatever goes here is pretty much captured into a variable which means that when I actually write a message for my developers saying something like, do not use that silly little um, method, instead of just like hard coding a me uh, message like that, I can use the variable. And on the right where it lists our matches, there you go. Um, the capture group, let's say, actually worked. And so this gets a lot more cool because the capture groups you can actually reuse within your pattern as well which means if i do something where i try to compare x equals equals x some group will make sure that whatever is in these places is actually equal to each other so let's say i could write some code like one equals equals one and now if i run this pattern here Samgrip understood that like both of these sides are equal, and thus this is matching our x equals equals x. And I will also show like another cool feature real quick. So let's say I say I have an ID named one, and then I'm gonna say if ID is one, then you should print. Let's just say print. I don't care too much about this. So SAMGRAP, because the SAM in SAMGRAP actually means semantic, well, it should understand variable perfect. OK, the issue might have been, wow, lots of things don't work today. That's really weird. Anyway, I'm just going to skip to the next slide, because I don't know why that didn't work. 
maybe by the end, somebody from my team who's, I don't know, perhaps in the call will jump in and help me explain that one. OK. Now, I already spent quite a bit of time on explaining the basics, so I'm just going to jump forward to a bit more interesting and advanced cases. So like what this actually looks like when you're using it in practice to detect, like, for instance, a, a bug in your own business logic. Let's see if this works yet. Oh, cool, production works again. That is great news, just what I needed to know. All right, so what we have in this case, I'm just going to walk you through this code where I'm going to be trying to like write a custom rule that catches like a very company specific business, business logic bug. Specifically, uh, let's say that this is some sort of really weird finance company where they have this really interesting way of designing the transaction system that whenever you have a transaction, you need to call verify transaction on it before you actually commit it to the database. So this is obviously like a very unsafe design, but we've definitely seen worse. So we're going to go with this example. <clears throat> and so what this means is you cannot just make a transaction on its own, because like in this case, you didn't call the verification function. You need to make sure that it is going in the right order. Like verify needs to be done before make, clearly. Um, obviously, if you just verify something, that's that's not an issue. And of course, like you can be like logging in the middle or anything. Still, the only really important bit is whenever you make a transaction, you need to verify it before that. Okay. The patterns for this, they actually look super simple. Um, you want to find any case where a function has make transaction inside and does not have verify transaction inside. So this is a new feature, actually, that I didn't explain before. But basically, you can compose multiple patterns into one rule uh, with a couple different ways. And this is one of them, where you want to make sure that some code is this and is not matching also this. OK. Now, with this case, where we do just like these matches for verify transaction dot 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 make transaction dot dot dot, there is actually one more bug case that could happen. And that's right here. So in this case, um, one human mistake that any developer could make is that they accidentally verify a different transaction than the one they are committing to the database right after. Now, this is actually something that is also easy to detect with SendGrab. The only thing that we need to update is the meta variable matching. So this is the same thing. Um, from right before that I was trying to demo. So let's say I'm just going to take these dot dot dots, these wildcard matching expressions, and instead say that I want to match the same exact object twice in a row in both of these. Because like if something else is going into the verify, that's no good. So I'm just going to run this again. And what we should see, indeed, is that SamGrep understands that this is actually insecure code as well. The wrong transaction is being verified, even though there is a verify call before the make call. All right. We might as well just jump straight to the like actually advanced usages and features. Uh, I'm going to start with maybe my favorite like interesting use of SamGrep that we have internally. Um, this one is basically, so like SamGrep is just like a nice little, pretty much Unix philosophy utility. It's just something that like gets a pattern and you get results and then you can do whatever you want with those results. So this means like you don't actually have to use it for security scanning. Another really cool use would be to just like find all occurrences of an interesting function and get like, and, and figure out what you're calling it with. So in this case, this is a Go API. And that's like the routing table of the Go backend API service. Um, now you can very easily write a pattern that like captures what routes are being defined in a project, uh, what are the handler methods, 
and like what HTTP word they use, etc. So now if you run SAMGraph over like an entire project with this pattern, or maybe over your like entire organization, you can get just like a really neat list of all API routes that you have in your organization or team. And what this means is as soon as you like extract all of this data, and by the way, you can see in this like list of results, how it like really like with these meta variables, it extracts the like API routes, etc. So what you can do then is create an app like this. We, we actually have this internally because we have a couple uh, backend services. So in this little map, what you see is like various projects, um, various files within those Python projects and all the API routes that they are defining along with some extra details, such as like these colors, uh, they mark whether authentication is required or optional or absolutely not needed for each specific API um, route. So that's just like a nice way, um, interesting way of using SamGraph, which is not security analysis. <clears throat> now, another thing that people really love is not having worry <laughs> about fixing these issues. So in this case, we have an example with a, an SSL configuration object where the minimum version is SSL3, which is like, you probably all know, old, insecure. You shouldn't be using SSL3, use at least TLS 1.2. Um, so now what we have here is another SAMGRAP rule. And you might be a bit confused because suddenly it's a YAML file where, while before it was like this nice little, um, like just little in input boxes. So like this YAML file is actually what describes a, a SAMGRAP rule um, because it's like structured data. Now we can attach stuff like the OWASP top 10 category or like some reference URLs other than just the, the pattern itself. And so the pattern that we are searching for is right here. It's just looking for any TLS configuration object where SSL 3.0 is specified as the minimum version. But now with this autofix feature, one thing you could do is define a regex string replacement that actually fixes the match. So in this case, what this says is whenever there is a match, look for this string inside it, replace it with this, and that's how you fix the code. And here on the list of matches, you actually see how not only did we get the message, but we also get something called the autofix suggestion. So I can just click this button here, apply fix. And you see that like SamGraph was able to actually change the code to be secure. Um, obviously this works with the command line utility as well. So like if you download SamGraph, you can just pa pass uh, an extra flag called I think dash dash autofix. And yeah, it's gonna make the substitution. Now I see that Teo, you uh, raised your hand. Yeah, I just, just wanted to, to ask here, uh, it will just do a replace there. Uh, what what will happen if you have that specific string in two locations, for example, it will just replace it in, in both locations because you may end up with <coughs> broken code, right? Or I, I mean, in the end, it's up to the developer to, I don't know, accept that change, but I'm just curious about that. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, so what I can say here is, so first of all, this is not as scary as it looks because the replacement only happens within this match. So like only in the highlighted area. So like it, it's not gonna go around changing other code. And like, if, if you are more worried and there's a couple different ways to do auto fixes, um, the simple stuff actually works in most cases. But now there's things like you could define, for instance, the number of times uh, replacement could occur. So like you only want to fix the first uh, occurrence of a string. There's like an entirely different uh, fix method as well, where you're able to just like write some new code like this and then reuse the meta variables, something like that, which is a bit smarter, but this one is still like, we are still alpha testing this um, method where like SamGrip tries, tries to like smartly understand, uh, whoops, that was supposed to be one three, but not that it matters. Yeah, so in, in this case, SamGraph will try to like smartly understand the code and make sure that it 
does something that's uh, not breaking yet. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. So you guys are already looking into something more smarter. Absolutely. Let's say, cool. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. If you want to know more about this, by the way, there's a docs link up here, and I think it's going to be listed under exter experiments. Yeah. So you can like see um, all the different ways you can use this. All right. Um, one more thing. <laughs> this is the last example I have, I think. As I mentioned that we support a lot of languages. Um, that's even more true because we actually support literally any language. Uh, we have this mode which we call generic pattern matching, which means that you can just use the same syntax that you always use and like for like searching for stuff like this. Um, this is the same pattern in this case. And so like whatever language, like as, as long as you have any sort of like text code, SAMGraph will match according to more or less the rules that you like, more or less according to the logic that I've described before. So for instance, in this case, here's a bunch of uh, Terraform code for which like we don't have, like we, SAMGraph doesn't know how to parse a Terraform file. But if you want to make sure that you never have publicly readable, writable buckets, then you can still write a simple pattern like ACL equals public read write. And again, even though like the white space here is confusing, it would confuse like a simple, dumb, regular expression. Some of actually understands that um, this piece of text, if it tries to like somehow parse it as code, then it's equal to this pattern that you're searching for. And of course, again here, um, I don't have an actual working example for this right now, but the same sort of um, logic operations that I've, I've demoed before for composing different patterns, they work in this as well. So instead of having like a huge, huge regular expression for like a Terraform file or whatever to um, match these things, let's see if this actually works. I, I've never tried scanning Terraform, but I think I should be able to just write this pattern here where I want to match anything inside an S3 bucket. So like, this says like, look for stuff inside S3 buckets where this pattern shows up. Now this is a live demo that I've never done before, but let's hope it matches. Yeah, okay. So yeah, you still have like all of these like smart composition features uh, we did get to match. And I can probably do like dot, dot, dots here and everything. Okay, so um, that's all good. Like now you pretty much know everything about how to write useful SAMGRAP rules and security scanning rules for your own, own projects. Now, if you actually wanna um, um, have the same sort of guardrails as we do, uh, like we like I demoed at the very beginning where I just like get a GitHub comment whenever I try to commit insecure code. <clears throat> Super easy to integrate SAMGRAP with pretty much anything because um, like you, you can either use a Linux binary, that right? you can just like download and, and run, or we also package it as a Docker image. So you can integrate it in like any CI system that is able to run uh, Docker containers. Or if you wanna like integrate into like something where you, I don't know, for instance, into a script that just creates GitHub issues automatically or whatever. So like SAMGRAP outputs its findings as like JSON or Serif or, Xcanit formats, um, you're not going to have trouble integrating it into any sort of workflow. Now, if you actually want to like try it out, we have a nice little like utility on samgrep.dev. So if you log in with a GitHub account, um, we can generate the entire like CI configuration file and just commit it to your project. Um, yeah, you just need to go to like samgrep.dev slash manage log in and click set up next to a project and you will see the screen. Um, either we can commit the config that you like with these little checkboxes configured for yourself or you can just copy the contents as well and just commit it yourself to immediately get scanning in GitHub projects. Or alternatively, like pretty much any CI provider you use, uh, the configuration is gonna look something like this. Um, we have a nice little documentation link that you see at the bottom. And yeah, that's pretty much it if you want to get like continuous scanning in CI. Okay, now um, one thing that I haven't really talked about yet 
is like I told you how to write custom rules when you have like something insecure that's specific to your projects. Um, obviously, you don't want to do that for every kind of vulnerability that exists. So <laughs> happy to tell you that we have this rule registry. Um, so we have like a, a GitHub repository. You see the link down there, uh, written to corp slash SAMGAP rules. And so this GitHub repository has over a thousand different rules for scanning various uh, security issues or maybe just like maintainability or correctness issues for all sorts of different languages uh, that was either written by us at R2C or written by the community. Also, what you see on the right is just because it's not really friendly to browse through a repository with like a thousand different files and find what you're looking for. You can also just go to samgrab.dev slash explore to see like all the different like packs of security scanning rules that we've already compiled or the, that the community contributed to us. And so like whenever you're looking at the <clears throat> explore page or whenever you want to like try one of these, um, doing this is super simple. You just install samgrab either with pip or brew or any of the other ways and you can just pass the name of the rule pack from the website as the config parameter so it would be like if you want to run the client side js scans then you would do samgrab dash dash config p slash client side js <clears throat> okay the last thing that i have for you is i'm just gonna blaze through this because it's probably not as interesting as the open source tool but we do have like a web app that we are working on so you can like chart your findings over time or so that you can just like select the rule sets or rule packs that you want scanning with on all of your repositories. But yeah, like this is probably not as interesting as the other things. All right. <clears throat> and so um, things we are working on, we have a huge performance update. I don't know, like you probably noticed on the um, website that the scans pretty much like finished in like one second and that's like that included all the time that it took to like spin up a new container for the scanning and all of these things um so samgrep is already pretty fast it can scan something like 10,000 lines of code per second usually or maybe 20,000 uh but we have lots of optimizations coming uh that are working progress right now and should be released in like two to four weeks maybe uh of course we are like working on all those languages that i showed at the beginning and we are of course also expanding our rule registry. So hopefully, I don't know, this time next year, we're going to be at like 3000 or something. Yeah. And uh, maybe one more cool feature that I'm kind of sad we don't already have, but will be really cool when we do is taint tracking, which is a kind of more powerful data flow analysis. So in this case, if, if you started thinking about like, how you can mark a variable as tainted, as in like this variable came from the user, from the request, never ever pass this to an SQL query, etc. So there are ways to do this by um, writing like longer SAMGRAP patterns where you say like anything that comes from the request um, shouldn't be passed into this function and you just like add lots of dot dot dots for like whatever might be happening between the request arriving and the request being passed into a, an SQL function. So what we want to do is kind of like an alternative syntax where you can just mark a specific variable as unsafe and say that it should never go into another function, another specific function, unless it goes through some sort of sanitizer. Okay. So that's coming soon. And here's another quick little, um, like, in, like a, a bit of instructions if you want to try either locally or online. Um, so for local Benji, users, we have a question. Uh, oh, I so, love that. Yeah. So can the library find the request URLs that are dynamically generated? Uh, so URLs so let's dynamic. let's say that uh, uh, he created the request and the URL is generated by string one or string two, uh -huh. and yes. if uh, evaluate expressions. Yeah, so I'm gonna assume that maybe this like let, let's just say that this is in JavaScript right now. 
I'm gonna try to write something for this. So, or actually, let's let's do um, a Python example. I'm just gonna write a rule. I think it shouldn't take more than one minute. So we might do something like I don't know Google, whatever came from the user uh, request dot params dot query. Let's say something like this. So uh, ju just to make sure I got it right, we want to find c code kind of like this, right? Like this kind of um, dynamically generated URL <coughs> with string concatenation. Does it sound right? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. I Hello. Uh, so it was my question. Uh, it was an example uh, where you made the, um, uh, I don't know, graph with all the requests that are done in your company. Ah, that one. All those examples. Got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so for the dynamically generated URLs, um, usually the way those work in my projects, so I don't know if this will be working for you as well. So the dynamically generated request URLs would be something like this. I, I would define like a pattern inside the route definition. Is this what you mean? Yes, yes, that's cool. That. Yeah. Yeah, but so, if that product is, let's say it's slash product slash close the string plus and another string, will you evaluate that expression or not? I see. Yeah. I actually think we will not because like, okay, so I think what happens is if you are just doing it so that the route is a bit cleaner, it's like you concatenate two strings. Let's see if this works in Golang. I think this should still be detected as a string. Yeah. So like here, we still detect it as um, like a dynamically generated route. Oh, wait, this might actually be a lot better than I expected. <laughs> I, I didn't realize, but yes, actually, we would detect this sort of. Because like if we do product slash, I don't know, let's say variable name product one. Plus that. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so in this case, um, this route meta variable will match not only um, like Most one single right. static thing, it will match like the whole thing. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So what would actually show up on the... Um, like, yeah, in this case, we don't have the user facing URLs on this image, but what would show up here is <clears throat> the whole expression that generated the URL. Yeah. So okay, like so this. you are getting the parameter that is something composed of something, but you are not actually evaluating to to see what are the possible values of, of that, or I don't know, get the actual value of it. <clears throat> yeah. So in this case, we don't. No, okay. I have a follow-up question. I think I understand this one. Uh -huh. uh, I, I also mentioned, sorry, that like sometimes yeah, no, we actually are able to do that. Okay. So we have some like understanding of constants. I'll try to find uh, an example in the meantime, but feel free to go ahead with your next question. Okay. So basically what you are doing is just code analyzing. You are not actually looking over, I don't know, some compiled files, some jar files or whatever. It's out of the compiler or I don't know, trying to simulate the compiler on some sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like we always only look at the source code. We don't run it through like actual, um, yeah, no, no compilers, no interpreters or anything. So we operate only on the source code. And in some cases we like understand the logic of the source code though. I, I'm just trying to find, uh, I think there was one specific rule that demonstrates this really well. Let's see. Hmm. By the way, uh, what I'm demoing right now <laughs> is um, the registry where you can like read through like each of these little cards is one rule that we have in our a rule sign of rules repository. And maybe I'm just gonna. Oh yeah, I think it's this one. So I'm gonna open this rule in the editor. 
so I can real quickly demo like how like SamGraph sometimes understands a bit more of what's going on as well. So here, um, the rule says that like Python behaves unexpectedly when you do like an or or end operation on the on on strings. Uh, you can read the like whole like there's like a long rationale up in the message. But I think what I should be able to demo here is if I say something like branch equals master, then SamGraph should understand that that one is still a constant string. Yeah, it's like this is always going to be a string. So the same sort of uh, considerations apply to it as if the string was right here. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any further questions? Uh, yeah, I have one. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, I have seen that some great uh, has like this feature of C analyzing analysis, uh, which is an alpha. But I'm curious, can like some great generate the same graph you presented for C related projects? Uh, for what kind of project? Sorry. Uh, for C related projects, so like C language programming. Mm. Yeah. So I'll be honest. I don't know very much about C and C analysis. Like I know that we have a couple like examples. So the best I can really do for you right now is show what kind of scanning like we can already do with okay. C. Okay. Oh. Okay. So, like, okay. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But uh. Oh. So only for like uh. It's like, I was curious if like, let's say I have a program, you know, and like have the same graph you had with the function routings, the same, uh -huh. like that graph, but like with each function and like to show me all the function calls and then like find automatically what's vulnerable and replace it. I see. Yeah. Um, we definitely don't have like pre-written rules for this kind of stuff. And I don't, I, I, I know that C is currently in alpha. It's um, not as well supported as like the, the other languages. So you might go bump into like parsing bugs, etc. Okay. Um, but I think theoretically, if you wanted to write rules for like generating that graph, then you could. Okay. And now like, well, I wanted to clarify one thing about this graph. So this graph generation is like not a feature of SamGraph. Uh, this is not like something that's um, actually public. It's just like one of our security engineers used SamGrep to get all the results, like all, all the functions that are API routes. Mm -hmm. And so like uh, yeah. this engineer generated the graph like locally with some script. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's no problem. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. All right. I have one more question. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, I'm a C sharp developer mostly, uh -huh. and I see that it's under develop. Uh, yeah. What should I do if, let's say, I have some hours to spare, and I want to help? Oh my God, I'm so glad that you <laughs> offered to help. So, like, I know that it's somebody in the community who is working on C sharp support right now. They have like a couple of pull requests open, um, and because of this, I think the best thing would be if I'm just going to edit this slide because like I, I can't write anywhere else nicely. So we have a Slack channel for the SamGraph community. You can go to r2c.dev slash Slack to join it. And if you just like join there, say hi and say that you want to help with the C Sharp uh, integration, then I will connect you to the other community member who is already working on it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, thanks so much for offering to help. I'll just, I don't know, put that link right here. Oh, god damn it, <laughs> something like that. So thanks, thanks a lot, Benche. It was a really, really cool presentation. Woo. We we've got lots of <laughs> nice things. So congratulations. Yeah, well, thank you very much for letting me speak here. Yes, so it was uh, our pleasure to have uh, to have you, and uh, our next uh, our next speaker will be Teofil Kojakariu from Petty Power Betfair. 
uh, which will talk about uh, security automation, security intelligence, and how you can automate as much as possible into the security uh, into the security world. So, uh, Theo, the stage is yours. Oh, hi, everyone, and thanks for having me uh, on this uh, on this discussion. Uh, as Katalin was, was uh, saying, I will present Surface Security, which is a platform, basically, written in, in Django. Um, I'll go through the story of the platform, um, and I'll talk a bit about myself as well. So I joined uh, Betfair like six years ago, and I started in the penetration testing team. Um, and after a while, uh, I wanted to automate a bit more than uh, what I was doing in the penetration testing team. And right now I'm leading the application security engineering team. And uh, our focus is surface security uh, as a platform and many, many other things. Uh, SAST is something that, that we have on our hands as well. I'll touch that briefly and maybe we can discuss about SAMGREP as well. Uh, we tried that uh, a bit and most probably we'll introduce it in the company as well, but I'll leave that for, for uh, the end of the presentation. Cool. So surface security, uh, as I was saying, it started as an idea to get some visibility in the company. And it started with some visibility at the DNS level, because in the end, if you are not exposed on the internet, it, it should be kind of acceptable, at least for a while, to, to have those endpoints uh, there. Um, and what we did there, it was uh, just a simple platform uh, in Flask at that time. And we were getting uh, notifications on Slack. Uh, if any new IPs or any new DNS records were being uh, seen available on the internet. Of course, we're going after uh, our own APIs um, where we have the, the DNS zones, uh, but it was, was very useful for, for the security team because we knew exactly whenever an application was exposed on the internet. You're thinking maybe that, well, that should be easy enough, uh, but we are really big company and we have like thousands of developers. So that's not always uh, straightforward to find out as a security team. And in the end, you have like just a few security engineers and you need to scale up uh, and take care of uh, hundreds of even thousands of applications. So it's not, uh, it's not that easy. And after a while, we started to use that for our security operation uh, team as well. We have a, an internal security operation team with almost 20 people uh, in the team. They are working 24 seven. And right now they are using Surface security uh, for tracking all the incidents across uh, of the company. And I'll get into more details in, uh, in the next slides. And this year, uh, or actually last year, because of the COVID, I'm, I'm still thinking that we are in the last year. Uh, <laughs> um, we got a bit uh, more traction in the company and we discussed about an idea which is called security score. And that's basically like a score for each of the applications and each of the security processes that we have in the company. And we are discussing based on that score with the teams. And you can think uh, on the security processes um, on things like SAST, DAST, uh, firewall rules, or, or anything uh, in between. So basically, we can see how we're standing in terms of security across of all of our areas. Um, and the last point is, is actually pretty important as well, which is Surface Security 3.0. Um, before um, this version, we had another uh, user interface which was a paid one. And we are pushing to make Surface Security open source as well. This is not yet uh, there uh, on GitHub or anywhere. But this was the first step uh, that we took. Uh, and right now, the, the interface was built uh, on top of a GPL one or a MIT one. But anyway, we can make that open source. Of course, we changed a lot of things in there, uh, but we're preparing step-by-step step to, to do that. Let's hope we, 
we can manage to um, to do that. Okay, um, about the um, uh, the platform, this is already uh, open source uh, internally in in the company, so anyone can just contribute to the platform, or they can uh, change the code. Of course, they will need to go through a merge request or a pull request, depends on where they'll they'll push the code. Um, we can approve that, and that can go in production. Right now, we have I think like. 30 or 40 people that contributed to the platform. I think even uh, our host, Catalin, <laughs> contributed some things while he was in, uh, in the company. Um, so yeah, we, we really want to, to, to make it open source, but there are uh, a few more steps before that happening. And to go uh, on the specifics of the, of the platform, um, as I was saying, this was uh, written in Django, so it's not Flask anymore, as it was the, um, uh, the initial platform. And you can think of this platform like something that is syncing data from all sorts of APIs, uh, are trying to correlate uh, those, those informations from the, from the APIs, and it will give you some visibility so you can have some, some good user experience that whenever you have an incident or you have a problem, you'll get that visibility right away. Um, and of course, on top of that, you can write your own modules uh, if you want so, because you already have the data there. Uh, it can be used from the browser. We are using it from Slack as well, or you can just integrate it with your uh, own chat um, tool. And of course, it can be called uh, from the API as well, because we have some other tools that are getting some of the data from, uh, from our platform. Um, and on Slack, uh, it's not a, you know, uh, a very complex integration, let's say. Uh, we did play a bit with uh, things like discussing with a bot or uh, some other uh, interesting stuff. But at the moment, uh, we are just um, have some regular expressions for things like uh, our subdomains, our uh, uh, DNS records, or some IPs. And whenever you are mentioning something like that in an in a incident channel, uh, the bot will start giving you details. So that's very handy, not only for the security, but whenever you have an incident as a company, because you just have an internal IP, but sometimes it's not easy or to to correlate that in, in one second, to find the application or the load balancers and so on, it, it's not that, uh, that uh, straightforward. And in terms of uh, users, uh, we are around uh, 800 users uh, that are using the platform. So as you can see, it's not just uh, security, it's, it's way more than that. Um, a bit about the, the technology stack, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, it's Python, uh, everything is uh, in uh, some dockers because we are using multiple ones. Um, as a database, we are using MySQL, but in the same time, we are indexing everything in Elasticsearch because we have like, like a global search that needs to be uh, really fast. Uh, it's similar to what Google um, uh, is doing with their interface. I'll show you on uh, a print screen of that. Uh, and for the automation, we are using Ansible. For the dashboards, if you are familiar with Grafana or Kibana, we are using those things. And we have Dcron as well, which is uh, an open source uh, tool. They have a paid version as well. Um, and that's used for uh, running crons distributed, basically, across uh, of, uh, multiple data centers because uh, Surface is running into multiple ones. Cool. Uh, between if there are any questions or any ideas, feel free to just, I know, raise your hand or just interrupt me. That's no problem at all. No. Okay. Um, in this slide, you can see uh, some of the integrations that we have uh, already. So basically, we did some modules to get the data from uh, these things. And we have that inside the platform. And more than that, we are correlating the, the, the data from one tool to another. Of course, the majority of the tools are from security, but we have 
quite good in integration and we get data, for example, from uh, Cisco or SolarWinds or some, some other uh, vendors. Uh, we get the data even from AWS uh, and we are doing uh, alerts or other uh, checks in terms of security. But there are many, many other uh, APIs that were uh, integrated already. So uh, to talk a bit about uh, what we built on top of the, the platform, I, I was uh, discussing about the security score. This is like your security posture uh, on all, all of your applications from the company. So this is very useful uh, whenever you need to get the necessary support um, in a company you will need to explain uh, most probably in multiple meetings why do you think that's, that's an issue in terms of security. So this is very useful because you are using the automation and you don't need to scale up with your time uh, to explain why is that a problem. You are just uh, creating a new security process. You are just um, discussing that and uh, get the right approval. And after that, everything will, will just go smoothly and you can get back to work, basically, to do engineering work. So this is, this is really good. And I think uh, many companies should uh, do something similar. I know that uh, some of the companies already started to have a similar concept where they are just getting all the security processes uh, to one single metric. But the issue is that they don't, or some companies don't want to invest the time into a platform that can give that number. So there are many times where you are just discussing and discussing and you have many, many meetings about how you can get that number when you're, you should actually discuss about who should write the code and create a platform where you have that visibility and on top of that you can create uh, like a like a dashboard and see how your security is looking like um, now in terms of uh, the score and the security processes uh, and the visibility that that we have uh, from the platform uh, we have that integrated in our uh, ci cd so the second step uh, whenever you want to deploy into production uh, we'll go to Surface and it will ask, okay, is my application uh, fine? And Surface can respond with an yes or no. And if it is a no, then you can't go in production and you need to contact security. Uh, you can imagine uh, what this process will look like if we are doing the checks manually. Uh, internally, we have a few thousands applications, so it's quite impossible to scale that up no matter how uh, big is the, is the security team. Uh, and there we are checking uh, things in terms of SAS, DAST, uh, if they have uh, integration with Vault or some, some other things as well. Now, in terms of vulnerability management, this is a, a, a huge topic uh, in most of the companies. Uh, we automated uh, almost everything from, from this area. So we are using Qualys. Uh, soon we'll use uh, Burp for scanning the external perimeter in terms of dust. Of course, we have a, a bug bounty program on HackerOne. Um, actually, from the last year, it's public as well. So if you want to I know, have some fun and hack us, feel free to, to do it. Um, and internally, we are using Qualys, AWS, and SonarCube for the SAST. Uh, but we already tested SamGrep uh, when we introduced SonarCube last, last year. And actually the plan is to use uh, both uh, in parallel, at least for some time, uh, because we, we really liked what SamGrep can do for, for us. Yay. <laughs> uh, you are welcome. <laughs> I'm not affiliated in, 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 in any way with, uh, with SamGrep, just to, <laughs> to say that. <laughs> it's first time when I'm uh, meeting actually someone from, uh, from there, but the, the tool is, is really great. That, 
In terms, that is what sorry I for interrupting. In in, yeah. uh, in case of uh, vulnerability management, do you integrate uh, the infrastructure uh, issues and also the application side, or what approach do you have? So um, there are a few steps here. As I was mentioning, the platform is uh, is like a data lake so we get all the information that we can see in our own infrastructure and in terms of applications and even owners of those applications uh, we get the results from the um, uh, the tools that are scanning our infrastructure and applications and sometimes for example qualis will just scan an ip but you don't know what's behind that ip so what we are doing is based on the configuration that we can see in our blood balancing rules or cisco and some some other things we are mapping that back to an application and based on that we are actually auto mapping kind of uh, those issues to an owner and that owner will get or the, the application will get a security score and that will be discussed in the in the right forums and to discuss a bit about the automation the platform is taking care of that as well so based on that uh, visibility that we have in the infrastructure whenever you are spinning up a new server in i know aws or in our uh, multiple uh, private clouds that that we have uh, we'll just spin off a, a scan uh, of Qualys or uh, AWS Inspector or even SonarCube or whatever it makes sense for, for that server or specific code that you want to deploy there. So, but there are many, uh, many things in there. And that's why we actually built um, in, the, in the beginning surface, because there is no single tool that you can use to actually build a security platform for the company uh, because those things should be programmed uh, for your environment so even if you'll pay like millions for for a, for a tool that you'll get from a vendor i can bet that that amount of money will be better spent if you are investing into an engineering team um, that's that's my view at least um, so to answer to your question, basically we are, we are using both automating the vulnerability management and getting the results and pushing them to a security score for the reporting. And the reporting goes up to the C level. So it, it, it's a bit hard to not do anything with, with that report, let's say. <laughs> Hope that makes sense. Any, anything to add, Kata? Yes, and it goes directly to the uh, group uh, CEO or only to the company CEO? So there are a few steps here. Uh, each of the manager will get a report for their area. Uh, each of the head of will get a report for their area as well. And uh, monthly, we have a meeting with the heads of some directors uh, from everywhere. and at one uh, one time per month we have a meeting with with the c level as well where we are discussing uh, the issues and we are not discussing just the security score we are discussing the risks that we have in the company as well they are uh, kind of uh, complementing each other sometimes we have risks that are being um, um, i don't know, taking care of a security score or based on a security score uh, we are raising a risk because we have that visibility and we know we can improve the things in terms of security. Hope that uh, I know. And in, a bit uh, yeah, and in, in Surface, each uh, director can see the other score uh, in the yes. like in the gamification uh, model. Yes, yes, okay. yes. <laughs> Everything is is pretty much open. Not not just the directors. Everyone can see uh, the score from from anyone else. Um, but just to just to point out uh, something here. We are not uh, comparing the score based on the name. It's more about the score per application or per area. Uh, so let's say security, because even security is having a security score. Uh, uh, so we are usually focusing on the areas that have more score and we are trying to see how we can get that lower because each of the security process will have uh, a score 
and each of the security process will have a weight as well. For example, uh, maybe SAS uh, is not with a I know really high weight because we need to confirm those issues. But the pen test issues, for example, or the ones that are coming from the bug bounty, those will have like a higher uh, weight. So it, you'll have score uh, even based on that. Any other questions on the this big topic, which is vulnerability management? No. Okay. Um, here we can see uh, the the user interface that we have um, on Surface. Unfortunately, I can't do like a, a proof of concept or a show and tell uh, because that's on the on the company uh, MacBook. But I really hope that we can do that <laughs> pretty soon. Uh, and here we can see um, another thing that, that we have in the platform, which is uh, surface uh, root boxes or surface security scanners. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be security related, but you should think of the root boxes. Um, so we have surface and we have some external uh, boxes and Surface knows how to provision those boxes with Ansible. So you just need to give uh, access on SSH to those boxes, that's it. And after that, what will happen is that Surface will run there some scanners, things like, uh, pretty sure you are familiar with Nmap or some uh, test SSL or some, some other uh, tools that will scan your, your perimeter. So, this is being used like, a, let's say, a virtual pipelines of, of scanners. And as I was saying, we have already the data related to the what IPs do we have, what uh, DNS records do we have, uh, and so on and so forth. So based on those things, we have some events and we'll spin uh, up a scanner that will just scan everything that is uh, at the perimeter level. And based on that scan, we'll, we can spin up even other scanners uh, like, like a pipeline. And I can give you an example here. Let's say uh, you, as a developer, uh, maybe somehow got exposed on WordPress, like on the internet, on a subdomain, which is being owned by, by us. Well, what will happen there is that Surface will just see that new subdomain. Uh, it will scan it with the... Um, scanner that is being written in Python by us. And it will just uh, check the ports and what else it can get from there. Things like HTTP headers, the cookies, and some, some other stuff. Uh, it will try to uh, even brute force some things in there, like some specific paths like slash admin or, or things like that. Uh, and it will get that information back uh, in Surface. Actually, Surface will get the information from the root boxes because there is no access into Surface, only um, Surface goes outside and uh, gets some, some information. And because that's an WordPress, then another scan will start, uh, which, is, which will be specific with WP scan or something like that. Uh, and this way you can scale up uh, into a lot of things because you are just creating a, a process or like a virtual pipeline and that will run there forever. So you don't need to take care of, of those things anymore. And on the right, actually, you can see uh, Wapalizer. Not sure if you are familiar with, the, with that. Uh, I can actually, so Wapalizer, if you are not familiar with, the, with this, um, this is a tool that can identify technologies on your website. So it will show you if you have like a specific version of jQuery or uh, I know a specific server on Java or JBoss or whatever. And we're checking uh, everything that we can see on our perimeter and we get that data back. And based on this, we can uh, respond to questions uh, very fast. For example, we uh, see an article on the internet and some jQuery is vulnerable or some Drupal or some, I don't know, WordPress. You can just go in, uh, in Surface and check if you have that uh, specific version. So that's, uh, I don't know, a really good use case. 
And here you can see even some rules that we have internally because uh, based on that visibility, we built uh, like some notifications. And whenever we see uh, these things, it will uh, raise an incident and that will be uh, taken care of by, uh, by our 24 7 team. Cool. Uh, we have even a scanner for uh, domain takeover. I know that shouldn't happen, but uh, whenever you are a, a big company, that, that's happening from time to time. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's really good to scan your perimeter uh, before the guys from HackerOne or uh, from the internet will, will do that. And actually, we catch some, some of them. And it's built on what uh, what tools? Nuclei or what? Did you use open source tools? Actually, uh, I think this uh, is a subject. Uh, not sure if that's open source, uh, but anyway, we modified the the scanners uh, specific for us. Um, right now, uh, we are working to open source those scanners. That will be the first step uh, from the platform uh, to to open source. Uh, probably it will happen in the next, I don't know, few weeks, months, I, I would say. Uh, we'll go uh, and push them on Doc Docker Hub or something like that, uh, because each of the scanner is a, a specific container, so like a Docker, and it will have an input, which is a list of IPs or host names, and it will give you the an output, which is a JSON that can be parsed. Uh, either you can get that in Surface, but that's not open source, right? Or you can just create your own scripts to push that, let's say, to Elasticsearch to get some visibility. So that's good enough as well. Um, okay, uh, we, we, we tried and actually we are doing some even um, fancier things, uh, like checking how the website is, is looking from a, a user interface perspective. And we are calculating given uh, a difference uh, between uh, the last uh, print screen that we did and the, uh, the current one. Uh, this is pretty useful because you can catch things like uh, old subdomains that aren't working anymore or they have an error or maybe it wasn't the case, but uh, for some companies, you'll catch, uh, if you got hacked, you'll see that uh, the difference from the from the last print screen will be like 100% because they just changed the, um, the website in full, right? So you'll get a, an alert right away. So this can be useful as well. Okay, and about the, um, uh, our security operations center, as I was saying, based on all of that information that we have, uh, the platform uh, for SOC is running inside Surface, and we are raising incidents automatically uh, based on what we can see there. And yeah, basically that's that's it. Uh, there are some, some things that can be, um, added as information for each of the incidents and for some of them we even have some templates uh, but i won't go into too many details here because we have um, uh, an engineering team in the SOC uh, team and uh, they are actually taking care of this module we are helping uh, from time to time only and some even uh, nicer things i would say uh, you can check on the second line uh, a bit about our scale uh, and why it's not that easy to just check if we have like a specific port open or if we have like a slash admin somewhere on the internet because we have a lot of DNS records and a lot of IPs and a lot of infrastructure. Um, and here you can see uh, a concept from, from Surface which is called Surface Explorer or the link explorer. So let's say uh, you are working in, in our company and you can see um, a link on the internet, let's say casino.betfair.com and you want to see what's behind that. What you need to do is to just put that link uh, in the Surface Explorer and it will show you some general information things like who is owning the application behind that endpoint, uh, what is the security score, if it was scanned and when, and, and 
so on and so forth. It will show you the network that we can see there, the SDN, the DNS records that um, where that endpoint is um, is available on the internet or the infrastructure, so the, the servers, uh, or even the storage or the pipelines, or even the source code, and if that source code is scanned with the, with the SAST. So as you can see, uh, the things are already uh, linked together. So it, for each of the applications, uh, we already have the source code, and for each of the source code, we already scan with, the, um, with our SAST uh, tools. So it's pretty easy to test some of the tools that we have in the market at this point. Um, and it's, it's easy to switch them uh, as well, because as long as you as a company control all the tools that you get from the vendors, from their APIs, you can just, I know, replace them or try a new thing as well. So that's um, another really strong point of the, of the platform. And Surface Bot, uh, as you can see on the right, uh, I was curious about uh, an IP and I got my information right away. So that's very handy. And in terms of metrics, uh, we have an Olympus, which is basically a Grafana. I'm pretty sure most of you are already familiar with that, uh, which is um, getting the data from the Elasticsearch. I was mentioning already that we are using MySQL, but we are pushing all of the data in Elasticsearch so we can create some metrics and some, some other things. Uh, and based on that Elasticsearch, uh, we have like a global search. It's right here at the, the top. Uh, it's not very big, but it's quite similar with Google, as you can see. Uh, but just the name is, is Surface. Um, and you can search into everything that we have in Surface. So let's say you have a specific firewall rule that is maybe somewhere in an office uh, on a specific firewall, you'll get that information here. Of course, not everyone is having access into that data, but you can do that with the, with the platform and find uh, the things right away. And I was talking about the, and about the, the open source uh, where they started to uh, do some work in this space. Uh, where they open sourced uh, a tool called uh, Spit that's uh, available on, on GitHub. Uh, what it does is basically to scan your code um, and try to find secrets because that's like in the last period of time, a lot of people are using GitHub and they are just online. And from time to time, it's happening to push your secrets in, in a public place. And that's not uh, very nice. <laughs> uh, so it will try to find your secrets and it can be integrated with Slack or with uh, your own tools. Um, yeah, so that's it. Basically on the left, you can see some code contributors for, for the platform. It started, I know, slow. And after that, it got, I know, very complex and everyone started to contribute. So that's very, mm, nice to see and that's it from from my side i really hope uh, we have some questions or no. yeah we have Discussion. a question we have a questions about uh, why use the decron and not salary for distributed or scheduled jobs from stefan magda uh that's a, a tricky one. Uh, as I remember, we tested both of them, uh, but for some reason, Decron was was preferred. Um, I don't know all the details uh, on, on this one, uh, but I remember we tested salary as well. Guess we, we wanted, not sure if salary actually is uh, quite good at distribution of uh, scheduled jobs. Not sure about that. I mean, you I mean, can do that if you are writing the code, uh, but Decron is is really good at that, and it is open source as well. And in terms of uh, domain subdomains and IPs, um, usually are you referring only to the uh, company level or only only to group level for all the companies inside the, the group? So that really depends on what we have access uh, because. Sometimes we have access uh, into a list of domains, but maybe those needs to be reported to another uh, company or another group. That's fine as well. So it really depends on where you are giving access to, to the platform because the API 
should be the same. Um, are there any other questions from? Uh, I can yeah, see another one on the question, chat. Question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a question on the on the chat. Uh, if I could briefly describe surface or Django structure, I guess that's uh, more on the documentation that can be uh, found on the internet, at least about Django. On the surface side, uh, we are just respecting the the standard, and we have multiple modules specific per each of the tool or specific um, on a topic, let's say, and we are getting that data inside that module for example we have one for aws another one for oracle cloud or so on and so forth uh, but in terms of uh, structure it's not um, very complex let's say uh, we have multiple modules like a django module a normal one and of course we have some things that are uh, built directly in surface like in the core uh, things like integration with Vault, where we, we are keeping all the secrets uh, that are needed for the platform, uh, or some other functions that may be useful for everyone uh, that are, being, are, are building some other modules, let's say. So, yeah, basically, it's, it's, it's more about that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Sounds really cool to have an internal uh, Google. <laughs> Yeah, we can we can say it like that. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you need to be um, just to mention this. You need to be careful with the platform, uh, and you need to uh, treat this uh, as a sensitive platform as well. So even low issues or very low issues that are being reported by the tools, we are trying to fix them because. Uh, yeah, it, it has quite some some power and a lot of information in there. So you need to protect that uh, a bit better than anything else, I would say. Thank you all. I want to take uh, the chance to say thank you, uh, Benche, for your presentation. Thank you, uh, Theo, uh, really cool presentation.